Thank you. Uh, my name is Ken Davis. I'm the dean of the law school, and it's my uh, uh, true honor to uh, welcome you all today to the 17th in this series of uh, lectures to honor uh, uh, Judge Thomas Fairchild, lectures organized by his former uh, law clerks. Um, our speaker today uh, truly does need no introduction to this audience. Uh, Russ Feingold was elected to the United States Senate in 1992 and re-elected in 1998 and 2004, the last time by a 12% uh, margin. He quickly emerged as a national leader on a wide variety of issues, including health care, uh, open government, civil rights, and, of course, campaign finance reform. Uh, we probably at the law school can't claim the senator as a direct product. He graduated from uh, a different law school, but we can claim him... <laughs> We can claim him as an indirect one because uh, his father, uh, Leon Feingold, known to uh, many people in the room, uh, was a graduate of the law school class of 1937, and the F entire Feingold family have been great friends and supporters of, uh, of the uh, law school over the years. So it's my great pleasure to honor our United States Senator, Russ Feingold. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Ken, thank you very much for that very nice introduction and especially for your outstanding leadership of this law school, which is very important to our family and to everybody in the state of Wisconsin. It is an honor to speak as a part of this distinguished lecture th series named for a son of Wisconsin who has brought honor to our state with his lifetime of service, both through his work to revitalize the state's Democratic Party and, of course, his service on the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal. Judge Fairchild, it is a great pleasure for me to be here today. We all know the brilliant legal mind and the exceptional character of Judge Fairchild. My brother David's here, and he can tell you, and I can tell you, or anybody who grew up in our house can tell you that uh, there was something very special in our home when we mentioned Judge Fairchild. Whether my mother would mention him in him or my father, it was always done with reverence and affection. In fact, he's one of these guys who's known me for more than 40 years, so in those days he called me Rusty. <laughs> my dad always said, he'd say, see that couch? Tom Fairchild made some of the most important decisions of his political career on that couch. <laughs> That's what he used to tell me. Now, I'm guessing, Tom, that you made some of those decisions on other couches, too. <laughs> but I was very proud of it. So, Tom, it's an honor to give this address. In keeping with the tradition of this lecture series, I want to examine matters of law, but also just tell some of the more personal stories behind the making of the law. When I was sworn in as a U.S. Senator, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution, but I could have never imagined how that oath would challenge me, how it would uh, bring me into conflict with those I admired, and how it would make my actions a source of controversy. For me, the oath has intersected with lawmaking and with politics in unexpected ways, and it's those intersections that I want to talk about today. By way of introduction, I, I first want to recall another oath to the Constitution. Because I am among a very small group of senators in the history of our country to take a separate oath amid one of the greatest or rarest spectacles a senator can witness, an impeachment trial. At the trial of President Clinton, I swore to do impartial justice according to the Constitution and the laws, so help me God. Only the second time in American history that oath was administered in a presidential impeachment trial. Now the trial may have been framed by politics, it may have even been inspired by politics, but those who sat in judgment on the president were bound by the law and the Constitution. That oath guided me throughout the impeachment trial and made me mindful of the duty we bore to the American people and to the Constitution and to history as we performed our constitutional duty uh, from January 6 to February 12, 1999. That impeachment oath raised the stakes, demanding more from us than mere partisanship. And I took that oath very seriously. And 
In a very real sense, it was the oath that led me to be the only Democrat to vote against dismissing the case before we heard all the evidence. And it was the oath that guided me also when I voted to acquit the president on both articles of impeachment. In the impeachment trial, the Senate acted as both judge and jury. But when faced with a motion to dismiss the charges, I felt that we were asked to apply certain legal standards, as would a judge. A motion to dismiss, in my mind, had a legal connotation that could not be ignored. When I voted against dismissal midway through the trial, I did so because I simply couldn't rule without hearing further testimony and all the arguments that the House impeachment managers had no chance of prevailing in the case. It wasn't that clear. And I'm sad to tell you my Democratic colleagues privately admitted to me that it wasn't that clear. After that vote, I was deluged with phone calls, both from some very angry Democrats who felt betrayed and some very surprised and confused and happy Republicans who thought for once that I had done the right thing. <laughs> Many on both sides misunderstood my motives and what the vote meant for my ultimate decision in the case. And they pulled no punches in letting me know how they felt. I have often felt that the very worst job in Washington, D.C. or Wisconsin was answering the phones in my office after I cast that vote. Right, Katie? It was a vote. <laughs> It was a vote where I tried to move beyond partisanship, just as I did with Republican Senator Susan Collins of, of Maine to frame the only bipartisan questions that were asked in the entire trial. But for a few days anyway, that vote put me squarely in the middle of one of the most partisan battles in decades. It was a totally unexpected moment, a result of an oath to the Constitution I never expected to take, a vote I never expected to cast, and a response I never expected to get. But that's exactly my point. An oath binds us in unexpected ways. Now my oath of office as a senator, which I have taken three times, thanks to many of you, reads as follows. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental, mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. In 1789, the first Congress had a much more straightforward oath of only 14 words. It read simply, quote, I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. But just as the Civil War transformed the United States of America forever, the shifting loyalties of members of Congress during that conflict transformed the oath. It was expanded to include what was known as the ironclad test oath, where members had to swear or affirm that they had never previously engaged in criminal or disloyal conduct. While this section was eventually removed after the war, to this day, senators still formally subscribe to the oath by signing a printed copy, a practice that was also put into place while the Civil War was underway. I think the ritual of the oath itself is deeply compelling and that the changes it has gone through serve to remind us of its significance in our nation's history. Even in the midst of the great national crisis, Americans have still believed that such an oath mattered, that to break the oath was to break faith, not only with God, but with the nation. The version of the oath we use today is a beautiful affirmation of loyalty to country, and above all to the Constitution, and to the rule of law. I have always felt great pride in taking the oath of office, both as a lawyer and a lifetime student of the law. But like the Constitution itself, the oath is not static. It creates challenges, and it makes constant demands. The oath has affected some of the biggest challenges I've faced in the Senate. First, when I worked to pass the McCain-Feingold bill, I sought to achieve a legislative goal without running afoul of my oath to the Constitution. Second, when I worked to fix parts of the Patriot Act that I thought could lead to violations of civil liberties, and ultimately voted against the bill, I believed I was upholding my oath to defend the Constitution against the bill that threatened our freedom. And third, as I have worked to stop ill-conceived constitutional amendments in the Senate Subcommittee on the Constitution, I have sought to uphold my oath by protecting the time-honored integrity and structure of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. In each case, my oath to the Constitution has cast me in a different role, not always one which was easy, but always one that I willingly and with some reverence accepted. 
which brings me to campaign finance reform. This is an issue I've been passionate about for many years. By the time I got to the U.S. Senate, I, I was tired of hearing that it was money and not ideas that mattered when you ran for office. I was tired of citizens of average means being drowned out of public policy debates while wealthy donors were being uh, catered to by both parties. Most of all, I was tired of seeing how commonplace it was for people to see their own government as corrupt. A situation where the public is constantly questioning whether contributions are influencing decisions in Congress is untenable. As Justice Souter more eloquently put the point in the Shrink, Missouri case in 2000, leave the perception of impropriety unanswered and the cynical assumption that large donors call the tune could jeopardize the willingness of voters to take part in democratic governance. To me, as I worked on this, it was especially that appearance of corruption that was so urgent for Congress to address. So when John McCain contacted me in 1995 to, to suggest that we do a bill on campaign finance reform together, I jumped at the chance. The success of our legislation, the progress of this issue has been one of the great thrills of my life. Certainly working so closely with Senator McCain, a, a true American hero, has enriched my experience beyond anything I could have dreamed of when I was elected in 1992. But it has also brought me into conflict with those who say that our bill violates our First Amendment freedoms, freedoms I have sought to protect throughout my life in public service. So flash forward seven years from the first discussion with Senator McCain, and I'm being deposed, deposed by famed First Amendment lawyer, Floyd Abrams, who is telling me that my bill violates the First Amendment. That kind of hurt. <laughs> I also want to point out that he complimented, complimented me in that deposition, saying that he didn't know of another senator who more consistently supported the First Amendment. But let's face it, he's a good lawyer. He was just softening me up for the deposition. <laughs> and it was nine hours. His questions about the constitutionality of the bill were a direct challenge and of the oath I had sworn to uphold. Needless to say, though, I paid attention, not only because I had sworn another oath to tell the truth that day in the deposition, but also because my reputation as a defender of the Constitution matters to me. At every stage of the McCain-Feingold fight, from the first introduction in 1995 to enactment of the bill in 2002, to the battle in the federal courts ending with the Supreme Court's decision in McConnell versus FEC on December 11, 2003, and even to this day, we have been accused of attacking free speech in the name of our cause. In fact, we spent a great deal of time crafting the bill to ensure that we would not violate the First Amendment. And I'll say a bit more about that later. But first, I have to confess that I did, at one point, cast a vote for campaign finance reform that I regret. And that, in retrospect, I believe was an inappropriate vote against the First Amendment. It was in 1993, and granted, it was a vote on a sense of the Senate resolution came up quickly with 20 minutes notice. It wasn't a very serious effort, but nonetheless, I cast a vote for a resolution introduced by Senator Fritz Hollings of South Carolina, urging the body to take up a constitutional amendment that would allow the Congress to impose spending limits in federal campaigns. The Buckley v. Vallejo decision struck down the attempt to limit spending in post-Watergate reforms, and Senator Hollings' constitutional amendment, had it gone all the way through the whole process, would have overruled Buckley. Almost immediately after I cast that vote, I regretted it. On the walk back to my office, I started rethinking whether I really wanted the U.S. Senate to consider amending the First Amendment to the Constitution, even to address the extremely important subject of campaign finance reform. And because there was good and constitutional legislation pending on reform at the time, a bill that actually preceded McCain-Feingold, I realized that passing a constitutional amendment would be a mistake. The threshold for amending the Constitution must be a good deal higher than that. And as someone who has spent a lot of time fending off bad constitutional amendments, I know whereof I speak. Suffice it to say, I learned my lesson. From that moment, I rededicated myself to ensuring that any reform legislation I authored or supported could meet every constitutional test that it faced. I want to emphasize here that I never viewed the Constitution as an obstacle to reform. It was, however, an appropriate restraining force that dictated what the bill did and the way it sought to do it. So from day one, we worked with constitutional scholars and legal experts to take constitutional concerns into account as we address the explosion of soft money contributions 
and also the phony issue ads that were commonplace in federal elections. We actually enlisted 126 legal scholars to sign a letter affirming the constitutionality of the soft money ban. I remember at the time that Senator Mitch McConnell, our main antagonist, dismissed our letter saying that he could find 126 legal scholars to claim the opposite any time he wanted, but he never did. <laughs> Indeed, as the debate progressed over the years, opponents of what we were doing pretty much gave up arguing that banning soft money would violate the First Amendment. Now, to stop phony issue ads without inappropriately cur curtailing speech, we created a bright line test applicable only during a limited time during election. By doing that, we believe we could convince the courts that the statute was neither vague nor overbroad. And empirical studies of advertising during the elections, partly done by University of Wisconsin people, that occurred over the seven years of the debate in our bill confirmed our claim. When the bill was about to pass the Senate for the first time in 2001. We knew it was time to finish amassing a record we had been building for years. The record supporting our case that the soft money system had stained the Congress with the appearance of corruption. Court challenge that we knew for certain would come foremost in our minds. We filled the congressional record with material making clear our legislative intent and painting a clear, even overwhelming and deeply disturbing picture of how the soft money system was tainting the work of the Congress and the public perception of its elected leaders. We also added a section to the bill providing for expedited judicial review of any constitutional challenge and making sure that we could participate as parties in that case to defend our work. The following year, both the House and the Senate passed the bill, and the President signed it into law, and then, then came the part that was in some ways the most nerve-wracking of all, the new law's journey through the courts. For better or worse, it was out of our hands. In seven years of a drawn-out legislative fight, we would finally see whether we had crafted a bill and built a record that would stand up to the scrutiny of the federal judiciary. We faced what Senator McCall McConnell proudly described as a legal dream team. Ken Starr, former speaker at this series, Judge told me. <laughs> Floyd Avery, Professor Kathleen Sullivan. The confidence, even arrogance, of those who challenged the law was apparent from their race to the courthouse to file the suit against the law on the very day that President Bush signed it. You might be interested to know that the NRA actually won the race. Senator <laughs> McConnell, McConnell was unhappy. He had to file a motion before the special three judge panel pleading to be considered the first name plaintiff in the case. <laughs> the NRA acceded to his request. So we now have the delicious irony that the landmark Supreme Court ruling upholding the bill he fought so long and hard against will ever be referred to as the McConnell decision. <laughs> <laughs> we had a pretty dreamy legal team as well, headed by Seth Waxman of Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, the former Solicitor General. Our team, at my urging, included my longtime dear friends, two of the best lawyers I've ever known from right here in Wisconsin, David Harth and Chuck Curtis. See John Skilton's here as well. David, sat by, David Harth sat by me in that deposition with Floyd Abrams that I mentioned. So I want to say a special word of thanks to David and Chuck and the other members of our defense team from the Heller Ehrman firm who really put in countless hours to help us out. So we had our own dream team. And we felt that we had done all we could to buttress the law's constitutionality. But we were never cocky, especially after the oral argument, four hours long where it became pretty clear that there were four solid votes to uphold most of the law, but the fifth vote was uncertain. I remember we discussed and prepared for a variety of scenarios and put them in five categories, ranging from total victory to total defeat. I think we would have been satisfied with category two or three, but in the end, we got category one. All of the central components of the bill were upheld in their entirety. I was particularly gratified that the court recognized the care we had taken in drafting the bill the overwhelming record we had developed to support it. Let me just read one statement from the McConnell opinion. Just as trouble, that's the name of the case. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would not want to offend the law school by improperly referring to it. Just as troubling to a functioning democracy as classic quid pro quo corruption is the danger that office holders would decide issues, not on the merits or the desires of their constituents, but according to the wishes of those who have made large financial contributions valued by the office holder. Unlike straight cash for votes transactions, such corruption is neither easily detected nor practical to criminalize. The best means of prevention is to identify and remove the temptation. The evidence set forth above, which is but a sampling of the reams of disquieting evidence contained in the record, 
convincingly demonstrates that soft money contributions to political parties carry with them such temptation. With these words, and many others like them, in the opinion, I was truly overjoyed. I was in a one of my staff members on the way to Fenimore, Wisconsin, in a blinding snowstorm at going to a listening session. And you know, that phone call came in, and I took three attempts to figure out if he was saying we won or lost. It was uh, really tough, but we found the good news. And for someone who has been a lifelong advocate and defender of the First Amendment, the whole experience was a little jarring. We were attacked by our critics and accused of violating the First Amendment. I found myself having to defend not only my own position, but also, in my own mind, my faithfulness to the oath I took when I became a senator. As a legislator, I felt a duty to address corruption and to uphold my oath. I felt I could do both, but others question it and frankly still do. That is a fact, but it does not undermine what the law has accomplished or prevent me from believing that we as reformers did what we needed to do while still showing respect for the Constitution. Before the saga of campaign finance reform and the Constitution had ended, and actually before our bill became law, I had another important encounter with the oath. After the horror of September 11, 2001, I found myself, like the rest of the nation, coping with that terrible tragedy. Emotions ran high everywhere, including in Congress, where members quite understandably felt an urgent need to take action, to strike back against those who so brutally attacked our country, and to do what we could to prevent future attacks. I couldn't have imagined in my worst of nightmares the attacks themselves, much less how they would test the American people. Those events tested every American somehow, tested their faith, their fears, the limits of their grief. Weeks after the attacks, I was given a test as a legislator as the Congress rushed through legislation to respond to concerns about our security without doing enough to protect our civil liberties. Here again, my oath seemed to present an obligation to defend the Constitution against those who I believed were sacrificing our liberties in the USA Patriot Act. Well, the administration sent up a bill just a few weeks after the attacks, and the Attorney General called on Congress to pass it by the weekend. It was my party that actually controlled the Senate at that time, a very few months, and insisted at least at first, we insisted at least at first on a relatively open process for crafting legislation. As chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee, I held a hearing on October 3rd called Protecting Constitutional Freedoms in the Face of Terrorism. But the process quickly deteriorated into a closed door negotiation between the administration and congressional leaders, and only a handful of members of Congress were able to influence the direction of the legislation for some way to address the civil liberty concerns I had about the bill before I came to the floor, uh, I actually had a chance to speak to Attorney General Ashcroft, who, who called me, because he heard I had concerns about the bill. I had known John Ashcroft for many years and was able to go over my concerns with him in a phone conversation. He agreed that many of my concerns were reasonable, and he told me that he would seek to make some changes, not all, but some changes that I had recommended because he wanted me to be able to support the bill. But as we later learned, it was the White House that overruled me and blocked any changes, including the ones that we've talked about. And that set the tone for a process that questioned the patriotism of anyone who challenged any part of the bill. In the end, the White House and the congressional leadership came up with a bill of their own. Senator Leahy, the then chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, tried valiantly to soften some of the most extreme proposals that the administration had made, but he was outmatched in the negotiations. And the bill was presented to the Senate in its entirety, entirety as a non-negotiable document. This was legislation on the fly, unlike anything I had seen in my career. And I hope unlike anything that we will ever see again in the future. Not only was the process disturbing, it was all happening incredibly fast. Many members since have admitted that they never read the Patriot Act, and that's in large part because there was so little time to do it. Then all of a sudden, the leadership in the Senate wanted to bring the bill up with an agreement to have just a few hours of debate and a final vote and no amendments. No amendments allowed. To pass this bill without considering amendments when the bill hadn't gone through the Judiciary Committee but instead had emerged fully formed from closed door negotiations seemed to me to be tantamount to abandoning any semblance of a real legislative process. This was troubling. There would be no opportunity to call public attention to the serious constitutional problems with the bill, whether it had to do with business records and library records or sneak and peek searches of people's houses or the ability to use roving wiretaps without ascertaining the, the, uh, the subject of the, of the 
roving wire tap. So I felt I had no choice. The only power I had left was to uphold my oath. And the only power that I had to effectuate that was the power that is given to every senator. And that's to object to unanimous consent agreement. And so I objected to the unanimous consent request to vote on the bill without any amendment. With that objection, I found myself at odds with many colleagues whom I admired. It also brought about one of the most difficult exchanges I've ever had with a colleague when I spoke to Senator Tom Daschle, the then majority leader. We had a heated argument at the back of the Senate floor, and I refused to let the bill go forward until I at least had a chance to offer a few of what I consider to be extremely reasonable amendments. Looking back on it now, I can think of no better example of the suffocating atmosphere in the Senate during that debate than those angry moments with someone who I considered a valued colleague. In the end, the leadership agreed to let me offer a couple of my amendments late in the night of October 11, 2001. I set out my position on the First Amendment and debated it with Senator Hatt. Republican Senator Arlen Specter spoke up in support of my position. We had a good, brief, but substantive debate about the intent and meaning of the so-called computer trespass provisions of the bill. We were about to yield back the time and vote when Senator Daschle sought recognition. He made the argument by this time that I'd already heard several times, that if we did open up the bill to amendment, it would get worse from a civil liberties point of view. This, mind you, after the Senate had already limited the amendments that could be offered just to my amendment. But that wasn't possible. <laughs> Senator Daschle said, quote, he actually said this, quote, my argument is not substantive, it is procedural. He went on to say, quote, I hope my colleagues will join me tonight in tabling this amendment and tabling every other amendment that is offered should he choose to offer them tonight, no matter what they were. My leader was asking them to be voted down. My colleagues were not only being told to vote against my amendments, they were being told to do so without any substantive reason. The message was, don't vote on the merits, just keep the bill moving, not, no matter what the cost to our Constitution. I'm very grateful that not every senator took this blunt advice. Although I never got more than 13 votes in support of an amendment that night, those few who stepped forward to support my efforts, including two Republicans, made a huge difference to me personally in what had become a somewhat frightening scene on the floor of the Senate. Although I had some support for my amendments, and a few senators voted in favor of all three, it became pretty clear that most, if not all of them, would vote for the bill in the end. And when the time came, I went to the well, took a deep breath, and voted no. I didn't know the impact of my career that vote might have, and believe it or not, I really wasn't thinking very much about it at that time. Then I came home. The weekend after the vote, I returned here to Wisconsin, and not without some trepidation. I was holding a listening session in the very liberal Walworth County on Monday, <laughs> and, and others soon af after, and I, and I knew that, it, as always, these sessions would be the best gauge of public opinion I could get. I was surprised and gratified to discover that in co counties all across the political spectrum, my vote against the Patriot Act was something that, that touched the court. People were genuinely concerned about the civil liberties problems with the bill. And even in the uncertain weeks after the terrible September 11th attack, they didn't hesitate to stand up in defense of their own liberties and the Constitution or to tell me to stand my ground. I'm deeply grateful to the people of this state for the encouragement I got at those sessions and for the support they've given me ever since. In the last campaign, my opponent made a big effort to make an issue of my vote against the Patriot Act. I don't think it played well, particularly because he started doing that before he'd even read the bill, but uh, <laughs> people in Wisconsin want a senator to take the job seriously and to be true to his, to his oath, even if they disagree with him. There's yet one other role I have in the Senate where my oath comes into play and where people disagree with me on a regular basis. I've served as either the chairman or the ranking member of the subcommittee on the Constitution of the Senate Judiciary Committee since 1997. I have been, unfortunately, only the ranking member for most of that time. You can believe it. We've only been in the majority since 1994 for 18 months in the United States Senate. The subcommittee has dealt with many hot-button constitutional issues, from flag burning to victims' rights to gay marriage. In fact, I've served as ranking member with, with four different chair, chairmen during my time in the subcommittee. And, and none of these people are what we used to call Rockefeller Republicans. <laughs> They're hard to find. Three of them used it as a platform to pursue their interest in those hot button issues. First, then Senator Ashcroft, when he was considering running for president in 2000. Later, Senator John Cornyn, making his mark in his first uh, term after he was elected. And now, Senator Sam Brownback, the new chair of the subcommittee, has already held hearings on pornography and has announced that we're going to have four 
different hearings on that top priority of America, the Gay Marriage Amendment. The only chair of the subcommittee who didn't hold many hearings was Strom Thurmond uh, <laughs> in his final years. I was running a little bit loose on the subcommittee at that point. From the moment I joined this Judiciary Committee, I've had a front row seat to witness the radical surgery that some want to perform on the basic governing document of our country. In the 104th Congress, when the Republicans took over control of Congress after the 1994 elections, it started with a balanced budget constitutional amendment and soon a term limits constitutional amendment, a flag desecration amendment, a school prayer amendment, a supermajority tax increase amendment, a victim's right amendment, and it went on and on. In all, over 100 constitutional amendments were introduced in the 104th Congress when the ranking member of the subcommittee was the late Paul Simon of Illinois. When Senator Simon retired in 1996, I asked to take his place on the subcommittee. I sought to be the ranking Democrat in the subcommittee because I couldn't think of a better place to fulfill my oath to the Constitution by fending off ill-conceived constitutional amendments. It's a personal goal of mine, a touchstone of my service in the Senate, to not allow this kind of abuse of the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights, on my watch. So far, so good, although there have been some very close calls, including some very close votes where the flag burning amendment nearly passed the Senate. The casual proliferation of constitutional amendments has tapered off somewhat, but persists to this day. In this Congress so far, 69 proposed constitutional amendments have been introduced. Since I've been in the Senate, I've seen legislator after legislator suggest that every sort of social or economic or political problem we have in this country can be solved with the enactment of a constitutional amendment. I firmly believe we must curb the reflective practice of proposing constitutional amendments at the first sign of trouble. The Constitution of this country was not a rough draft. We must not treat it as such. And so, since my vote on Senator Howling's campaign finance resolution in 1993, with one exception, which I'll discuss in a moment, I have consistently opposed every constitutional amendment that has been proposed in the Senate. When considering a constitutional amendment, I ask two fundamental questions. First, can the problem the amendment seeks to address be dealt with through legislation? It is not enough for a constitutional amendment to make possible a wider variety of legislative options. Senator Howling's amendment, for example, would have reversed the Supreme Court's Buckley v. Vallejo decision to permit Congress to enact spending limits for campaigns. But I concluded that the problems with campaign financing in this country could be addressed through legislation that does not run afoul of Buckley, and Senator McCain and I did just that. The second question is whether the issue to be addressed is so significant in its impact on the structure of our government, the safety and welfare or freedoms of our citizens, or the survival of our democratic republic to warrant an amendment. There's no question, for example, that for Congress or any state to outlaw flag desecration, a constitutional amendment is necessary. The Supreme Court has said so in two cases. But I do not believe that the shameful expressions of disdain for the flag by a handful of protesters each year threatens the future of the Republic. I don't believe that the threat to our country from flag burning is nearly great enough to warrant changing the First Amendment. There's only been one time since 1993 when I thought an amendment met both of these tests, and that was when Senator Cornyn brought his proposal concerning the continuity of government in the event of a terrorist attack before the Constitution subcommittee. No legislation that the Constitution now allows us to pass can deal with a situation where a significant percentage of our legislators in the House are dead or incapacitated, and the effective functioning of the legislative branch is threatened. Nor does the Constitution permit us to plan for a time when a very large number of senators are incapacitated, but not killed, for example, by a biological attack. As we know, historical events can sometimes alert us to vulnerabilities or flaws in our constitutional structure. Of course, the assassination of President Kennedy led to the adoption of the 25th Amendment. The attacks of September 11th have alerted us to the vulnerability of the legislative branch of government to massive vacancies, and I believe warrant the adoption of a 28th Amendment. But again, this has been a rarity in my experience in the Senate. All too often, some senators see constitutional amendments as a political tool rather than an extreme step that, if successful, will fundamentally change our constitutional landscape with implications for the future of this nation that we cannot predict, much less analyze with any confidence or certainty. Working on the Constitution Subcommittee has given me ample opportunity to make the case against abusing the Bill of Rights, uh, and if anything certain, it's that I will have almost limitless opportunity to continue this work as long as this Congress is, is in office. <laughs> I have no doubt we will continue to see a steady stream of these proposed constitutional amendments 
which often make up with tremendous political momentum what they lack in legal judgment. Protecting the Bill of Rights is an ongoing challenge, just as reforming our campaign finance system and protecting civil liberties from overreaching legislation such as the Patriot Act. None of the issues I've talked about today are static, and neither is the oath I took. As these issues move forward, the oath will continue to offer constant challenges and make constant demands. The oath has brought me to unexpected places and to controversies I could have never anticipated, and sometimes in conflict with people and organizations for whom I have great respect and with whom I usually agree. I have wondered more than once how trying to uphold my oath could put me across the table from Floyd Abrams at a deposition, alone in the well of the Senate a month after the September 11th attack, in the midst of heated debates over some of the most controversial social issues of the last decade, and yes, viewing the videotaped testimony of Monica Lewinsky in a heavily guarded room in the Capitol. <laughs> what has surprised me the most is how complex it has been to uphold the oath to which I am bound, whether I was trying to work within constitutional boundaries or trying to stop others from going what I believe to be was going beyond those boundaries. I hope I've generally made the right decisions, but the question, our questions are never easy or clear cut. I have struggled constantly to get it right, to adhere to my oath and go where my best judgment tells me to point. I have no doubt it will remain a challenge for as long as I serve in the Senate, as long as the difficult issues before us test our fidelity to the document that every senator pledges to uphold. I think that that is the friction, the tension, that truly gives the oath its power. The history of the oath reminds us that even in the most difficult times that this country has faced, people still believe that those words matter, that they bound us to something larger and made us strive for something better within ourselves. I too believe that they did matter and that they still do. I'm proud to have taken the oath to be sure. But most of all, I'm privileged to have a job that lets me try each day to keep it, to endure its tests, feel the pull of its weight, and bear its solemn and historic responsibility. It is that effort that defines not just my work, but the work of the Congress and the work of the nation. It is that effort to which we are all bound, to which we all must be dedicated, if our nation's greatest document and our highest ideals are long to endure. Thank you very much, and my good wishes to you, Tom Kirchhoff. Thank you, Senator, for that very uh, powerful set of remarks. Um, and uh, to, to thank you for your uh, appearance here today. We did have a hard time convincing the US Marshals that this was benign, by the way. So, uh, but uh, I hope you'll find a place for this in your Homer office. This is the gargoyle, the, uh, the symbol of the uh, University of Wisconsin Law School. And it's inscribed, 2005 Fairchild Lecture, Senator Russ Feingold on behalf of the University of Wisconsin Law School. Thank you. <laughs> the Senator has graciously uh, agreed to take a few questions. Um, and if I could just ask you, since we have an overflow room, um, if uh, when, once the Senator recognizes you, if you would wait until uh, one of our students gets uh, one of these microphones in your hand that will uh, allow people throughout the building to hear. Yes, sir. Professor. Senators, sometimes one hears from members of Congress a statement like, it's our job to pass the laws, and it's up to the Supreme Court to decide if they're constitutional. Um, there have been a number of occasions where there's been a tension as to the independent right and independent responsibility of the executive branch and the legislative branches to make determinations of the constitutionality of certain actions. We saw it in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and often in cases of um, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. 
What are your reflections on the role of um, the Senate and the House's corporate bodies to make independent determinations of constitutionality in areas like that? Well, I certainly don't think we have an obligation to, to be certain or either that it be highly likely that something will be constitutional. I think if we have every reason to believe that something simply cannot be constitutional, it's extremely unlikely to be that we have an obligation not to pass it. That's one of the reasons, apart from the merits, that I implored my colleagues not to pass one of those uh, computer indecency bills, which just was clearly, I mean, even Clarence Thomas struck it down. Uh, it was nine to nothing. And I just said, why are we doing this? This is, this is inappropriate use of legislation. Uh, it's just going to take a whole bunch of time. You're not going to get what you want, other than maybe a political statement. And you're going to you know, take up the incredibly valuable time of our federal judiciary and the United States Supreme Court. So I think, I think that's inappropriate. But, but for us to have sort of had to have guessed you know, whether Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was going to do this wonderful thing or not, I don't think that's our job. I think our job is to pass what we think is good public policy with a good faith belief that it could be ruled as constitutional. So I, that's how I look at it. So a bit related to that is the question that the Constitution obviously on its face is not always clear. And so my question for you would be, how do you determine when you think something feels or you think it is or is not constitutional? Do you have your legislative staff research what the Supreme Court has done, or do you come to your own interpretation based on your own interpretive methodologies? Well, of course, my staff uh, does a great deal of the work, and, and especially the lawyers on, on Judiciary Committee. But uh, I, I would say that the presumption in my mind is when I see a piece of legislation before me, I'm going to assume it's constitutional unless somebody warns me. I think it would be too great of a restraint on legislative creativity if, if we had the slightest concern that something was unconstitutional. If there's a vagueness in the Constitution, that, that's an opportunity for us to see if something can be done, if there's an opportunity to get it done. The Constitution is supposed to be a, doctrine, a document of limited powers. And so the Constitution is not supposed to be a restraint on the powers of, of, the, of, the, of the people of the country. It only grants certain powers to the federal government that are enumerated there. So I think it would be a mistake to treat it as a document that restrains you unless there's good reason to believe. So I, I need a higher standard when somebody says to me, look, Russ, you really shouldn't be pushing this. It really cannot be justified as constitutional. So I think the presumption is it's constitutional unless somebody tells me this really can't, can't fly. Everybody. <laughs> As a matter of fact, most of the students in the enrolled in law school don't have the foggiest notion of who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, in view of your perception of your obligation under the Constitution, what do you do when you are convinced that the Supreme Court's decision is wrong? and unconstitutional. That the Supreme Court's action itself is unconstitutional. No. The existing decision. But the decision the itself is, is, a, is a wrong decision. decision. But the decision conflicts with the Constitution. Is wrong and contrary to the Constitution. Well, my first uh, instinct, of course, is to see if there's another way to overcome what the Supreme Court has done. And that's about winning elections. <laughs> that's my first instinct not to pass constitutional amendments. It's about changing the Constitution, the composition of the Supreme Court, so we can get judges there who would uh, follow the law. What you're telling me there is that there's a situation where even the Supreme Court did not, did not follow the law. So that would be my first instinct. Barring that, yes, you have to at least consider the possibility that you have to take a step. It could either be uh, statutory or constitutional to override the court's decision. Those are of course, if it's statutory, the Supreme Court can strike it down again. The only thing that can trump them is a constitutional amendment. So in that case, you would then, cons one, one thing you would consider is introducing a statute that would be contrary to Bucky, Buck Buckley or Vallejo or Plessy versus Ferguson 
and then let that go to the new Supreme Court to see if they would yeah. perhaps that would have, be, a, that would have a change of mind. That would certainly be my, my preferred option rather than a constitutional amendment. But it may sometimes not be possible, as was demonstrated, obviously, uh, the need to pass certain constitutional amendments uh, after the Civil War. Going once. <laughs> twice. Oh, did you have another question? In which case, all 100 senators have their own notion of what is constitutional, and in taking the oath, it may guide their conduct at in, 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 in some cases. They may have to push for something that, in their judgment, is constitutional, but the court, in fact, has That's gone right. the wrong way. No, I agree with that. Now, so, let, so in let, me take an ex let me take an example for, uh, from my own beliefs. I, I still believe that the decisions that were made uh, striking down the death penalty in the 1960s, uh, late 1960s, were correct. I believe that the court is moving in this direction at this time. I believe any actions I can take short of constitutional amendment, which I would be loath to do at this point, to overturn those decisions are decisions that I would take, and I've been delighted that this Supreme Court, seven out of nine judges appointed by Republicans, have made two huge rulings striking down aspects of the death penalty. One having to do with mentally incompetent individuals, the other is uh, having to do with people who were juveniles at the time of the commission of, of, the, of the capital crime. So that's an exciting example of how the law can evolve even in times like this where I believe in the end the Supreme Court will rule that once again that the death penalty is unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment. So I, I found that to be an example of how it, it takes enormous patience, but I believe we're moving in that direction. I, I realize I'm pushing the envelope a little bit, but doesn't that actually mean that you and those of us who served senators in drafting legislation essentially are in, engaging in counting votes of the Supreme Court, ultimately. Can we get five for this? I, I'd say that's only the case in the kind of ins instance that you mentioned, which is where you think the court is clearly wrong. I'd say as a general rule, you have to accept the fact that the court is the supreme law. A good example is the line item veto. I voted to create a line item veto. Senator McCain and I believed it was time for the president to be able to get rid of these, these various pork projects and other things but we were slapped down very hard by the Supreme Court. Instead of regarding that as some sort of a illegitimate act by the Supreme Court, they didn't know what they're talking about, but frankly, res I respected it. It was a case of first instance. I don't believe that the court had ever taken that matter before it. So to me, that's the normal situation, but there are extreme cases that I can imagine having a different action. Boy, this is uh, very much like being back in law. <laughs> One more question? Yes. Oh, you're the person with the microphone. Uh, yes. Way over here. Way over here. Russ, I'm interested in uh, what went on in your deposition, because at least I would understand that a court would look at the statute and the record in front of the legislature and inquiring into your motives or what you personally thought about it or any other legislature legislator, I'd always considered that out of bounds and that they wouldn't allow that. So how is it that you got to have that enjoyable eight or however many hours it was being deposed? Well, you know, I agree with you. I and mean, that's why we made the record we did, the enormous record, but uh, there was no way to prevent the parties from deposing us. That didn't mean that everything we said would have been admissible and at the uh, federal district court level where it began. I'd ask Chuck whether all of that was admissible or not. Was all of my dep it was not, correct? So what, what Floyd Abrams uh, did was he would say, okay, you see this ad? This ad ran in California. Is this ad okay or not okay under your law? <laughs> it, was, it, was tough, it was tougher than the question the guy just got. Uh, because, you know, that's not what legislators do. We don't sit around and go, okay, I can tell you exactly where this is. But, you know, I sort of went through the process with him. But it was a very strenuous, and it was sort of nine hours of trying to confuse me and, and, or, or in the case of Senator McCain, trying to get him angry when they did it to him. Uh, but it, I, I'd ask Chuck, uh, how much of that, was much of the deposition ever used? Was much of the, my deposition or, or the, or the, part, or the uh, portions, part? Portions of it were used, and we had objected to many of Abram's questions. Because of the, that very reason. Right, right. It, 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 it
So your point is obviously correct. Thanks so much. reception will start immediately uh, right outside those doors. So I hope you can all join us. Thank you. What was that?